the digital transition. The Digital Transition, brought to you by Fulton Trotter Digital, a podcast series created to assist those tasked with implementing digital strategies, where we will share our knowledge and experiences to support you in your transition. Welcome to The Digital Transition, podcast number seven. I'm your host, Nathan Hildebrandt, and today I'm chatting with Bon Brian Digital's Rob Jackson. Rob and I today are going to talk through the scenario of being in a client's position and and the role that they need to do to uh, request or specify uh, their digital information requirements. Thanks for being here, Rob. Thanks, Nathan, for inviting me. So firstly, Rob, for those that are not aware of who you are, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? So yeah, I'm uh, an Associate Director with Bomb Brand Digital. Um, by training, I'm a qualified architect, but uh, these days I'm uh, effectively a BIM consultant and an information manager uh, dealing with uh, both uh, internal architectural projects and also consultancy for external projects. You're well known across Europe and Australia as an open BIM expert and, and very well known on social media channels, and, and especially Twitter. You're also pretty famous for other things. How many BIM awards have you actually won? <laughs> Do you know what? I've probably never counted them. Um, we've won a fair few awards um, over the last few years and um, it really is about you know entering those awards in the first place. I think probably I'm most proud of uh, winning um, Construction Computing Awards Best BIM Project of the Year three years in a row. Um, something you know most people probably win a Best BIM Project of the Year if they're lucky once, but to win it three years in a row was uh, some achievement. Unfortunately, we couldn't make it four, but uh, we got shortlisted. But you know we'll we'll keep trying, and um, you know the awards is a nice recognition really for the work we do. Now. I think the project you're referring to is that Lego, the Lego house, wasn't it? Yeah, that's certainly one of them, yeah. It's actually an award-winning blog and I think that 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 Lego blog post series is one of the most valuable resources for people that are firstly investigating uh, BIM and digital processes. Can you just touch on, and I know there's, you know, 28 of them, isn't there? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Without going into too much detail because we we talked for half an hour about it, what what do they what do those blog posts cover? Well, uh, when I started um, with the idea, and I think it was something I talked to you about actually a, a long time ago, up in, uh, with up this in idea a, up in a uh, high rise building on a on a viewing deck, yeah. I believe. <laughs> Indeed. Um, um, what started off as a very simple idea to explain the concepts of various um, workflows with a with a model, um, and using something that that basically lay people could understand so that you don't a lot of people don't understand the construction process and don't understand how to um necessarily you know what buildings are about so you know what is the vehicle for doing that and um there's obviously a number of things that people have tried with that and minecraft being one but lego is something that you know i think everybody can kind of relate to so it was really a vehicle for being able to explain these concepts and a lot of those concepts are around open bim processes so using ifc kobe bcf as as um exchange um, schemas to uh, move data around, but but also looking at some of the other things like 4D, 5D uh, processes and laser scanning and so on. And uh, through that process, I learned quite a lot as well. Um, and the idea was really to share some of those things through through something that everybody, um, you know, is, is child's play really. Um, so, you know, as, as the original idea for the, the blog piece was, you know, every BIM is awesome. Um, that's kind of how it was born about really. And I really got excited by that that series and I think that it actually is a great thing and I, I did originally, after seeing the full series, thought about how it would be actually nice as a book as well as, you know, it takes away from the digital thing but it, it becomes kind of something where analogue people could relate to it more as well. Now moving forward, I guess, uh, you've said you've won numerous awards um, and I was very lucky uh, last year to uh, win a, an award named after you. What's it feel like to have an award named after you? <laughs> Um, pretty crazy. I thought it was a bit of a joke to start with. It kind of, you know, I'm a, a bit of, um, it can be a bit of controversial and push the edges on, you know, social media. Um, so, you know, people know me for that. And I suppose, you know, really, I, I kind of um, took it as a compliment ultimately um, for, you know, making some progress in the in the open BIM space, really, in terms of, 
um, convincing people that open standards is a is a way forwards. And so to have a, an award named after me is, you know, uh, very pleasing. Um, but I suppose it gives me more pleasure to, um, you know, choose people who I think are truly deserving, uh, you know, of those awards. Um, and, you know, you were the, the first recipient. And this this year we gave it to Arto Kivinyemi really for a, almost a lifetime of service towards uh, open BIM. Uh, and hopefully we, again, we can do the same again next year. I'm looking forward to seeing the next winner now. Moving on, we've talked a little bit about yourself. Now you've you've been with Bon Brian Architects for a number of years, and a few years ago you started Bon Brian Digital. Do you just want to share us a little bit about the services that Bon Brian Digital provide for clients? Yeah, so um, Bon Brian Digital was set up in March 2016, um, so just before the UK um, sort of had to um, implement BIM, I guess, on government projects, and it really came about through. Um, the fact that we'd actually built up quite a lot of expertise um, through the architectural business because Bon Brian sort of first and foremost is an architectural practice. Um, but the digital brand basically offers primarily information management. So we're, we're particularly interested in the data side of things, but we also offer uh, coordination management as a as a service, so essentially or very simplified, you know, clash detection uh, and associated around those and, and managing those issues. Um, and we also offer a lot of consultancy, so we can support practices, um, you know, outside of projects, you know, with with implementation um, or even supporting, um, for example, contractors' bids um, where they need to um, demonstrate extra value, really. Yeah, so it's a broad broad list and, and I guess we mm-hmm. could talk once again for another half an hour about the services and uh, for those that aren't aware, you know, uh, Bon Brian Digital and Fulton Trotter Digital, when we formed Fulton Trotter Digital, uh, actually put in a strategic alliance uh, since March last year, purely because of our, our beliefs and, and, and our thought process aligning so much so we could actually deliver value for clients uh, in the UK and in Australia. Now, I guess the main purpose why we're talking today now, I want to, let's, let's move into the meaty bit and, and talk through the experiences that you've had in the UK in terms of um, working with clients to understand their requirements. Now, over the last couple of podcasts, we've I've, I've spoken to uh, the likes of uh, Richard Choi, uh, where we talked about NatSpec standards here in Australia. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I also spoke with Marcia Volpagni about uh, level of detail or level of information need and and the challenges where clients are specifying either too much or too little or not not enough or not understanding it. And then we've also spoken to uh, Dave Philp about the, the kind of broader picture about the, the UK stuff. So let's let's have a bit of fun because I guess it's about learning and for people that are listening today, I guess the key view for them would be to actually get an idea of the, the, the scenario that would occur. So let's imagine right now that they've already put in place and understand from a business needs perspective uh, that they actually want to undertake a digital transition, or they want to start specifying digital deliverables. So, so let's let's run through that scenario, Rob. What's their first step? I think you know uh, people to go through a digital transition. I think the the primary thing is to look at what you've already got and and try and assess. Um, you know, how do you want to move that stuff into a, into a digital world? And that can be you know, really simple stuff. You know, there's a lot of stuff we did in our own office that you wouldn't call BIM as such, but you would certainly call a digital transition. So, for example, we had to call our filing cabinets. There were loads and loads of paper taking up loads of space in our in our office and, and simply turned, uh, scanned a lot of that stuff in and turned it into a, a digital format. Okay, it's not particularly intelligent, but it certainly helped us in terms of being able to search and find for information and and going forwards didn't have to keep all this kind of stuff. So really, you know, from an organizational point of view, it's looking at, you know, how do you make your business better and how do you go about turning that into a, a digital process over an, over a number of years? You know, it's not something that you do and say within six months, we're going to be fully digital. Um, you know, we've seen with everything that we've we've got in our in our own lives, how we're moving towards, you know, apps and, and clever technology, um, you know, allowing you know, to adjust your heating from your phone or, or whatever it may be or order a taxi. And and really, you know, the digital transition in the, in the construction industry or, you know, with clients is really about um, doing a very similar process and, and just looking at the things, your pain points, really, and then um, documenting a lot of that in terms of, you know, very simple, plain language questions, really, which in in the new ISO terms is a project information requirement. So it's really about articulating, you know, those issues that you want to try and solve, really. So really it's sitting down and, and almost doing a 360 review of your business and understanding the, the problems that you're having 
mm-hmm. and, and finding yeah. processes that currently are either archaic or need to be or, or have ways in which could be improved. So one of the things that, that people, we haven't discussed ISO 19650 on the podcast in detail yet, but or you know even BS 1192, but for those that aren't familiar, the idea of uh, ISO 19650 is it, it wraps around ISO 5500, which is in is international standards regarding asset management. And then that also yep. wraps around ISO 9000. And one regarding quality assurance in terms of in terms of improvement of processes and continual improvement of processes. So, the reality of it is is that ISO nineteen six hundred and fifty is is just a documentation of a process to to essentially achieving a high quality outcome. Would you say so, Rob? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think you know that we kind of get very or have got very bogged down in in the the, the model aspect. And and actually, you know, the the, the new ISO is really uh, very much about information management. And that, and that's everything from your drawings and your models to every single document that you produce. You know, and so um, you know, one of the things we did a number of years ago is we went through uh, we employed an external consultancy to look at our business. And one of the things that came out of it, I, I thought I knew our business pretty well, was people complaining about about having to fill in a um, paper copy holiday form for for requests, which to me had never really been an issue. But to quite a lot of people, it came up. And we've now put a system in place where it's digital and people can basically get their holidays approved by uh, a director or uh, another party who's looking after them. And, um, you know, that, to, again, is a very, it's a digital transition. Okay, it's not to do with necessarily projects, but that's what we're basically trying to do with projects. We're trying to do a very similar thing of taking out those things that people find uh, frustrating or annoying and replacing it with a process that uh, improves their life to manage their information in a, in a lot easier and uh, better process. So there'd be two sides to this story. So the first side and the way I'd always look at it is all asset owners have their primary business and their primary business isn't typically looking after their asset. So their primary business may have assets being built assets from which they need those assets to be in good working order and they need to be well maintained to enable them to service their clients well. So hence yep. why you have a scenario where they may have business processes which they may focus on quite stringently with regards to service delivery to their clients and maintaining their business so their business runs efficiently. But then when they have major clients that have assets, they may be just still not interesting or, or embracing digital uh, methodologies yet. So the things you talk about, about holiday leave, might be as simple as order, ordering a maintenance person to come and change the light bulbs, for example, through absolutely. An but then, but then, yeah, sorry, but then you know, you look at um, user perspective as well. You know, being able to book a room that you you know in, in an office or uh, any kind of um, establishment, um, and being able to find if that room's available, having that information about uh, you know those rooms and uh, you know the spaces within the building, uh, you know, essentially is data, but you know drives a very simple user process. So. Um, you know, it, it can in, it can impact on all aspects of a of a day to day running of a building, not just not just in the maintenance side, which is kind of where a lot of people are focused. It can have impact across across all of your um, or across all of the assets, really. To you know, down to those user experiences, really. So it becomes a, a a broad scenario where it actually can contribute to your actual business, not just your built assets. So that's an important factor to consider. I think the important thing as well is to consider the uses. You know, it's the uses of the information that you need. You don't need to worry too much uh, in the first instance about, you know, exactly what data you want. It's about specifying how you're going to use that information. And we see a lot of um, client documentation which kind of kind of skips over that really and doesn't really say what they're going to do with this information or how they want to use it. Okay, they might not have the technology in place for some of it, but they haven't really thought they they did dive straight into the detail of, of, oh, I want this piece of data, but what, yeah, well, why do you need that piece of data and what's it going to drive as a business benefit? So it's really thinking about, um, you, you know, the uses first and then, and then delving further into the detail later. So it's it's the reverse of what Simon Sinek suggests. So they've asked for the what without understanding the why and the how. Correct. So so let's start this process now. So we've got to, we're, I'm, I'm going to be a, a naive client, Rob. You're going to love me. Yeah. And, and uh I'd like to have BIM, thanks. You can you can have BIM, <laughs> but what but what do you mean by BIM? So, uh, one man or one woman's BIM is um, potentially just doing a three D coordinated model. 
And, you know, having a 3D coordinator model is certainly going to provide some advantages in the construction. It's certainly going to reduce the risk and potentially could reduce the cost to you as a client if you if you ask for that. But equally, um, if you, for example, uh, require a schedule of the accommodation, then that's that's a BIM deliverable effectively. That's a, an information requirement um, for you to make a decision about um, the number of spaces that you want in a building. Equally, you might want a room data sheet uh, and a room data sheet, you know, with all the equipment and you're making that a design decision early on. Equally, of course, you could be wanting uh, information for planning or for regulation uh, approval um, you could be wanting it for funding uh, purposes. So it's really about understanding um, what do you need information for uh, and then trying to work out, you know, how do you don't then uh, work through that detail? And obviously, you know, as a consultancy, that's what we, we hope to do with clients is in, um, like yourself as an acting client, um, you know, help you through that process to understand what it is you want to use it for first and then, you know, exactly what data and where that data needs to live in a model in order to deliver your requirements. Once you've sat down as a consultant and asked me my project information requirements through a variety of different formats, it could be through uh, the old language that you use from PAS 1192 where it was plain language questions or it could mm-hmm. be through a survey or, or similar similar scenario where you sit down and do a, a review of a business and provide advice to that business depending upon how sophisticated the client is, I'm guessing. Yeah, absolutely. And and in you know, to be honest, it varies a lot. So a lot of the times, and I will you know be very honest about where we are, is a lot of the times the clients are coming to us very late in the process. They've already got a team on board. And you know ideally you want to do this before you even appoint, even before you've got a project actually ideally, but certainly before you appoint a project project team because if you've got a project team in place it may be that they can't deliver what you want so you know you're going to have to select on that basis i think you know you also everyone has to recognize that BIM is not free and and certain processes can be. But at the end of the day, you know, if you're investing and that's what it is, it's an investment uh, in the information you require, then then there is going to be a cost associated to that. But over the long term, it's the long term benefit that ultimately is going to um, drive your business. So, you know, um, how how we go about advising or working with clients can vary very considerably, really. Sometimes we're actually doing it from behind a contractor and we're helping the contractor um, interrogate some requirements that already exist or alternatively, we've got a blank sheet of paper um, you know, to work from and, and a client who's very engaged. And, and one thing I would say, you know, as, as part of this podcast is clients often go uh, either scared of not being far enough ahead or um, or running away from it. I think, you know, we're not here to scare people. We're here to work with them. And if they want to ask really stupid questions, then, you know, that's what they should be doing. They should, there are no stupid questions in many ways. Um, you know, the, the most stupid questions are the ones you haven't really thought about or there's a very simple answer to. So I think, you know, Every client is different. That is the reality. And some things work for some clients and, and other things work better for others. But, you know, it's about working together um, through that, you know, the consultancy part of it uh, to help them achieve their goals. One thing you touched on lightly in the last statement was in regards to, first of all, understanding requirements, but then understanding the capability of the supply chain. How important is that? Because obviously there could be needs or desires, but no one can deliver it. Well, I think, you know, the critical part is really, you know, once you have got your requirements, um, you know, documented, then it's a case of um, putting out as part of your tender requirements. And, you know, that that tender requirement can include all kinds of stuff that you would normally go out with. But setting your criteria for what you want your supply chain to meet, whether it's going to a, a lead designer like an architect or whether it's going to the contractor directly and asking them to um, provide your needs. But, you know, you need to interrogate that they're capable of delivering what you want and you know it's up to them to to set out whether they can deliver that information so you know often um part of a standard process is to require a a BIM execution plan which in the past has been called a pre-contract BIM execution plan is now referred to a pre-appointment BIM execution plan um is for them to respond to how they're going to deliver that now again quite often that gets missed and you end up with teams on projects who perhaps don't have the quite the right experience now that's not necessarily a problem if you understand that so a client might understand that a particular engineer say doesn't have all the requisite but as long as they're keen and and willing and 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 wanting to to work to deliver that then that's not necessarily a problem but they have to work out if that's an issue it might be that it's a really 
specific asset that really needs a, an expertise and you have to take a view on it. But like anything, so, you know, when you assess a designer of whether they're the right person for the, for your job uh, to design your building, it's the same from a digital perspective about whether they're able to deliver what you need. That's a really important point that you touch on. Now, when I am, when a client's looking to engage myself as, a, as an architect or a design team, they'll normally issue a project brief, which outlines their design requirements that they'd like us to put a fee proposal against. And then likewise, when uh, uh, an actual physical asset goes to tender to a contractor, if it's going through a, tr- a traditional method, the design team will provide a specification in terms of the expectations of the, the materials and, and workmanship, along with a set of draw- drawings and documents to essentially document the extent of materials and, and finishes and the actual built asset. What suite of documents, and I guess we might go through these one by one, what suite of documents need to be produced uh, or, or provided by a client to enable the supply chain at the designer's level and the contractor's level to actually effectively provide a, a, a the correct pricing for a product, project? And one of the things I guess we could touch back on from a podcast I had with Marzia was talking about the right information and not and not having digital waste. Yeah, I mean, again, this depends on um, the kind of process you want to put in place. Now, if you want to follow, um, you know, the uh, ISO 19650 route, then there's a very specific uh, list of documents. I'm probably not going to go through all of them, but, you know, there are some critical ones in there. For example, we've just already we touched on it earlier, the project information requirements, which in broad terms in, in our old language in the UK would be plain language questions. So very simple questions around what what it is you actually want. Um, and then probably going below that are your exchange information requirements, which are, are much more detailed in terms of the information that you require. Now, there's a, there's a number of other things that that sit alongside that. There's a information standard, information protocol, um, and then there's also your your tender tender information. So you can you can follow those standard, and, it, and it's all very clearly set out in those documents. Or alternatively, you know, you can take a view on um, how you want to set that information out. At the end of the day, clients are not um, unless you're a, a particular government client, for example, who has to use these standards. Then you're kind of free to do what you want. But the important thing with it all is to set out those requirements and to take i would say to make sure that that's part of your tender process what what we often see and certainly when um i'm sat helping arch- the architectural side of the business is that clients will ask for their usual stuff they want a brief and here's the project and uh, we want a design and here's the time scale program and here's the cost um, and then they'll say they want bim and it, we price that um, we take a view on how we price it but the person down the road who's pricing against us might price it very differently so yes you may get a cheaper cost from another consultant um, but if you haven't set out those requirements then you're going to get a, a very wide ranging so it is about making sure the requirements are clearly documented about what you want even if even if you said we have we don't know what we want but we you know we want to do BIM and part of your price might be a provisional sum or or whatever it may be and we'll agree it later but you know being clear about where you are setting out those things and uh, and the more detailed you can be the better in some cases I I have seen a lot of detailed proposals unfortunately which are very detailed but actually then have to be picked apart and kind of rebuilt so um, if you're going to do it um, you have to do it in a kind of very clear and succinct way that you think that the team or the um, supply chain sorry will be able to deliver. One of the things you touched on lightly there once again was in regards to uh, clients that aren't government potentially not choosing to follow the ISO 19650 standard. Um, I have kind of views on that where the the positive of 19650 is that it's flexible and enables you to scale up and down your usage of it. So that's the first kind of point. But secondly, the benefits of a client choosing to follow a standard means that it's more likely that the supply chain would be more capable or ready for it rather than a bespoke system or am I missing the point? No, and I would agree. You know, I'm a, I'm a great advocate of standards and, you know, that the open BIM side, of course, you know, which we touched on earlier is, you both know, a us, big yes. part of what we, uh, yeah, both of us of what we do. Um, open standards are extremely important and um, being able to use the software of your choice is, a, to me, is a, something I'm very passionate about. Um, but equally, you know, following standards allows you to, to potentially automate, speed things up, 
uh, create a more consistent and better result. And our focus as a business has always been to focus on these standards. And the more that we focus on the standards, the more that we can um, use those to improve our business. And um, I would always advocate for a client to follow standards. All I'm saying is that there is no strict, necessarily strict requirement to follow the ISO. And, and in fact, the, the ISO standard uh, for information management really is a framework. It doesn't actually go into a lot of detail. So in the UK, there's a number of other documents that sit still alongside those, which may well become uh, international standards. And, and I'm specifically there referring to, for example, information security, which is you know an important to topic for people, um, protecting your data, um, health and safety, um, and then standardized format for handover of information at the end of the process, which in the UK we use COBE, um, which is covered by BS 11.9.2 part four. Um, so I would always advocate those things, but I think it, again, it's still about making sure that it's right for the business. So, um, you know, you have to look at that and, and take a view on it. Um, I would say ultimately it's cheaper to apply international standards or, or national standards if, if those are, uh, are relevant or even specifications um, because they're, they're something that everybody can focus on and you've got a, a baseline as well for when you go out to the supply chain that they understand what they've got to deliver. Now, when a client receives a built asset, they're reasonably well aware or it's very reasonably easy to identify that the majority of the products or the actual size of the building or the shape of the building is what they originally asked for in their brief. And a set of drawings is reasonably easy to read and and understand, you know, I match this drawing to this building, it looks exactly right. For a client to under, to know that they're getting the information deliverables that they've asked for, what what sort of processes um, should a client have in place to ensure that they're getting the information that they needed and wanted in the right in the right time and the right place and meeting their requirements? So yeah, from our point of view, it's very much about looking at the information that the client required. And assessing, um, you know, the information that we've received from the team uh, to meet those requirements. So that can be as very simple as checking that the file names uh, that they said they were going to provide match the the file naming standard that, that the client specified. Or it might be very detailed in terms of checking, for example, that that a fire rating has been provided for uh, every door. Um, and you can go even further than that and say, um, you know, are the values for that fire rated door a specific set of values? So, for example, 30, 60, 90. 120. Um, what we often see in models, if you don't do that, is you get 30, 30 mins, 30 minutes in capitals, uh, 30 min minutes not in capitals, and you get all kinds of variations uh, on that. So you're getting a very inconsistent deliverable. Um, so what we try and do is obviously make sure that those requirements are very rigorous, and therefore then there's a checking process that can be largely automated, not fully automated, but certainly I would say in the models probably about 90% of it can be automated. Um, and you can you know apply that to um, other things as well and making sure that, you know, um, certain aspects of, of the requirements have been delivered. Um, we're not responsible as information managers for ensuring the data is actually correct. It's still down to the to those who authored it, but we can certainly help the client uh, prove that the information that they wanted is what is the information they're getting. And ultimately that improves the quality of the final, final product so that when we're not accepting as many defects or, you know, we're keeping those defects to the absolute minimum at the end of the project. Now, touching on the comment you made about just the fire ratings and the data structure, what problems could a client have if the data isn't structured the way that they want? Well, if the if the uh, the data that they're getting isn't isn't in the in how they want it, then it's largely going to become unusable, or they're going to have to sit and pay somebody to map or move the data into places that they need this information to work. So, having a consistent, not just a consistent requirement, but also a consistent deliverable, um, is absolutely key. And I I would probably hand on heart look at a lot of projects out there that have been delivered today and say most of them will probably be unusable uh, in a number of years because they haven't really thought about it now no one's perfected this process but certainly going into you know where you want that data to be in a um in from our point of view perhaps in an ifc model um, that i want my fire rating under a a property set which essentially is a folder a specific property set to to find that information means that i can then 
consistency and it keeps my cost down because I can keep the you know being very clear about putting it in the same place but I think even the reality is if you went and took three or four models from uh, the same client they may well have received very different deliverables unless they've been very clear about exactly where that data needs to live and I think the reason why that's actually really important is actually about the the actual the actual technology or the software or the cloud-based applications that they're trying to link this this database to and the consistency of uh, the place names and the and the naming structure is critical so that they can manage it, all of their assets effectively yeah absolutely and you know we often get asked about existing assets and you know clearly there's going to be some work to do uh, to bring those assets up to up to scratch but you know existing assets are also a really good way of understanding what you've got and actually what you're missing uh, to understand your requirements as well so um having that consistency over you know again it's a long term journey if you like um but again built around standards you um you're ultimately going to be able to you know use this information efficiently and effectively as a client as well well as the design team so you're going to get a much much higher quality deliverable and for people like developers you know potentially they can sell their asset uh, for an increased value if the, if the quality of the data is extremely high so it means that when you're purchasing an asset you're not only getting a physical asset but you're getting a high quality digital asset as well to make absolutely so that they become more valuable now we've, yep. we've covered off on that process and what occurs throughout so for a client, ideally, you're sitting there and you're specifying the deliverables before you're engaging the team and then yep. having a, a person or a firm provide an information management role to actually check that that information is meeting your requirements throughout the project delivery at the times that the information is being delivered when you want it and how you want it at the right time. Yeah, I mean, the information management bit, if, again, referring back to the ISO, and I know it comes a bit boring, but the, the information management function is actually mentioned twice in there. Once where the client's defining their requirements, so the client having somebody uh, in that function to, to do that process, and it may be that that person stays with the client side all the way through. They may be an internal appointment or they may be an external appointment. And then you have information management from a, a, the what is now called uh, the lead appointed parties. And those lead appointed parties might be the, the designers um, or they might be uh, the contractor. And, and then they would have information management function. Now, you'd like to think, or you could put it on the contractors and designers to do that process. But as a client, and you may do that as well, but as a client, you'd also want to make sure that you're receiving the information uh, that you asked for. You know, um, you can trust other people and that's fine if you've got a good working relationship and or they can demonstrate that they're doing those processes but you know from a client's perspective if this information is truly that valuable then you know they should be putting in place um safeguards against that it'd be just like having defects inspection lists or or a similar scenario what do they call them in the uk um stop (laughs) i can't can't even think of the word Um, punch lists or something Clerk of works is the word. No, the so, yeah. defects, the things that when you've got yeah. defective work, they, they have a, um, a certain yeah, we list. Have snag, snag, we have snagging lists in the snag UK. Snag lists, that's it. Yeah. So, yeah, in the UK we have uh, snagging lists and then we have cl- a clerk of works working on uh, the client side to check the physical build and, and sometimes checking against the drawings. But actually, um, I know my colleague Emma often refers to it, but, you know, the idea of a digital clerk of works checking yes. the information is that you've received is a is an extremely positive idea that I think, you know, hopefully we will see um, certainly on some projects and, and increasingly, you know, to make sure that you actually receive what, what you um, what you specified. Now, a couple of weeks ago at our Brisbane event, and this is when we had our LOD discussion or LOD focus. One of the we had a, we have a forum at the end of the at the end of the night, and I was lucky enough to lead the forum this night. And we were talking about one of the questions from the audience was from a contractor's perspective, and they were they were really excited about how they said, "Well, you know, ten years ago or a number of years ago, we worked with a client. We worked really hard. We built, we delivered the physical asset, and we delivered this wonderful digital digital asset for them. And now we've come back to this digital asset, and they've made so many changes to the physical asset, and the digital asset is actually now out of date. From your perspective, Rob, critical of importance not only if you uh, if if a client uh, invests the energy to 
specify and pay for a digital deliverable at the end of construction, the level of importance for actually maintaining it? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. But I think the first thing we have to understand is that, you know, we're talking about information and we're talking about managing that information and handing it over to a client. To many clients, they actually just want the the data. They want the information part of that process. That might include PDFs, it might include drawings and, and theoretically or going forwards and increasingly may require models. But, you know, most most organizations don't necessarily um, manage their own um, drawn information as it stands or, or and certainly not going models. Um, if we, I think if you look back at uh, traditional scenarios, most clients that we get involved in who have large estates who you would think would be able to manage um, drawings, don't keep their drawings up to date. So you end up paying to resurvey that information. So, you know, you have to look at it from a model perspective and ask the client, do you really want to have a model? And are you going to have the resource? Again, it's about investment. Are you going to have the resource to keep this information, um, these models up to date in order that they're usable both for you and ultimately, you know, to hand back over to potentially another contractor or design team to, to continue working. Um, and I don't think that that's for everybody. I think some clients might be able to do it um but and you know a larger client like a university with a huge estate potentially can have a team who are doing that um, but equally i've seen clients who you know uh, don't necessarily have processes in place to stop people putting holes in walls for example um so the, the estates team who are managing the estate don't know about that and suddenly you know there's a hole in a firewall they then have to pay the money so they're doing uh, a lot of maintenance that they wouldn't necessarily have anticipated um would the model have helped possibly um you know but certainly um having processes in place and having good uh, ways of managing your information is is key not just in the design and construction phases but in the handover so um in terms of keeping models up to date you know that i would ask hard questions of clients to make sure that they are going to to do this otherwise there's very little point you might do it as a record um otherwise you're going to be paying somebody to to update it much later on to to reuse it so maybe a solution actually is, is during the per, the phase of actually developing the deliverable requirements at the start of the project, the requirements also then are setting out the client's management of those of those of those digital asset after it's constructed. So what things are going to be maintained and what things aren't. So maybe that's an additional kind of document to um, have as a as a user guide for the client, similar to a maintenance manual for their building that they have. Yeah, I mean, you know, you see a, a number of clients who specify their requirements at the beginning and then leave it to the design and construction team and don't think any more about it during that design and construction uh, phase, really, until it's handed over. And they haven't really necessarily got a strategy in place for what they're going to do with it. I think some of those clients, the ones who rebuild, I mean, you know, a lot of clients don't necessarily build lots of buildings uh, over and over again, but some some people do. Uh, and where you've been through that process, you've probably seen that, you know, and an understanding that, you know, you maybe need a better strategy for actually going to do it so you know the more intelligent clients might develop the requirements and during the design and construction process put in place processes and technology and even people uh, to be able to manage that that information that they're going to receive at at the end of the project and ultimately through the full uh, life cycle of the asset which you know is where is where the cost ultimately is so um if they if they want to invest in it you know in f facilities management is has been um over the years probably not as well invested it's probably even behind construction in that regard and you know we really need the facilities management industry to come to the table and and understand that you know investing in your assets is or understanding for clients as much as anything is understanding that you're investing in in your asset to to um, make it work harder for you and and work better and and have less issues ultimately as well for users at the end of the day one of the things I want to ask you, mate, is a final question, and one of those questions I'm going to actually ask all of the guests I have on on, on our podcast: uh, What does BIM mean to you? BIM is, uh, in in very simple terms, BIM is better information management, um, and that is supported by open BIM processes. So, for me, it's all it's all about the information. It, the models is a vehicle for that, but you know, it is really about finding better ways to manage our information both through the design, the construction, and ultimately the operations phase so that everybody can deliver construction projects more efficiently, more effectively, um, so people can make more profit, but also so clients can um, see the value and the the benefit to their their asset in the long term. Perfect answer. It sounds exactly like me, mate. But thanks very much (laughs) for your time, Rob. 
Thank you, Nathan. So for more information on Rob Jackson and Bon Brian Digital, please head to our website and find the links to various pages and documents that we discussed today for further reading. I look forward to sharing our next podcast in a fortnight's time. Until then, good luck with your digital transition. If you would like assistance with your digital transition, please contact us at digital at fultontrotter.com.au. For more information, or if you'd like to continue the discussion in the comments section, head over to our website, thedigitaltransition.com. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss out on our future podcasts. We would also appreciate it if you provide us with a rating and take the time to provide us with a review. Thanks for listening to The Digital Transition, brought to you by Fulton Trotter Digital. Digital transition.